<laughs> Sorry about that. Hello, and welcome to the Virtual Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the director of the Hammer's Public Programs, and I want to welcome you all to tonight's conversation with artists Christina Quarles and Miguel. Before we start, I have just a quick note for the audience. Please note this program is being recorded and will be available later on the Hammer website. The program is a Zoom webinar, so we can see your names and anything you type into the chat or the Q&A boxes. And we'd love for you all to introduce yourselves in the chat box and feel free to talk with each other there. And the Q&A box is where you type in questions you have for our guest speakers. So on to our speakers. Christina Quarles is a Los Angeles-based artist whose multiracial identity informs her practice with bodies, subjectivity, and ambiguity all apparent in her lush paintings. She was born in Chicago and raised here in Los Angeles. She completed her undergrad at Hampshire College with a double concentration in philosophy and studio arts, and then earned her Master of Fine Arts in painting and printmaking from Yale University in 2016. Christina currently has solo exhibitions at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and at the X Museum in Beijing, and she has an upcoming solo exhibition at the South London Gallery in June. Christina was one of the featured artists in the Hammer Museum's 2018 biennial Made in LA, and she currently lives and works in Altadena, California. Miguel is a singer, songwriter, producer, and all-around Renaissance man, also from Southern California. Over the last decade, Miguel has established himself as an artist who is unafraid to follow his creative impulses wherever they may lead him. His music is deeply influenced by his Mexican and African-American roots, and his lyrical, lush, award-winning music pushes the boundaries of R&B. His Grammy award-winning song, Adorn, went double platinum, and he's had 12 songs so far on the Billboard Hot 100. As the recipient of 10 Grammy nominations, it's no surprise that his last two albums debuted at number one on Billboard's R&B Albums chart. He also has hit collaborations with Mariah Carey, Usher, J. Cole, Travis Scott, and ASAP Rocky, among others. Last month, he collaborated with reggaeton producer Tiny on the single Sunbathe, and his new EP that just came out two weeks ago is called Art Dealer Chic, Volume 4. Miguel is also an activist who's used his platform to speak out against mass incarceration and inhumane immigrant detention centers. And tonight, he and Christina Quarles will talk not only about their work as artists, but also about maintaining mental health in the current tumultuous moment of history. So please join me in welcoming Christina Quarles and Miguel. Hi, welcome. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Excellent, excellent. <laughs> How's it going? Christina, I love your shirt. Thank you. It's like from uh, Lauren Halsey from Made in LA 2018. So I figured oh, I'd, you know, wrap the hammer a little bit. <laughs> your shirt's cool too. What's the whole, what's the whole thing say? This is uh, Destroy Systemic Racism. Um, kind of did this like to benefit um, Build Power as like a sort of a pre-drop. Actually made this so. Kind of cool. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, very cool. So yeah. So much. Much. <laughs> What's that? I said, thank you for making time. Um, I've been a fan for a <laughs> long time. Um, the introduction, I, I think, was was perfect, especially in describing all of the things that I love about your work and um, especially the ambiguity and the bodies and the color and fluidity. Um, always, always inspired. So I'm just, uh, I'm really, I'm really happy <laughs> yeah. To well, thanks. Yeah. I'm super excited to also be chatting with you. Cause I've been also a fan of yours for a while. It's funny, like in grad school, because when you're an artist, you like a painter, you basically are just alone in your studio all the time. So you'd have to like listen to music to feel like you're not completely crazy. Um, but in grad school, I was like listening to your album wild heart like on repeat so <laughs> this is very like full circle i'm like that's how i was coming up with these ideas <laughs> like, like your music and like you know that that song flesh is like <laughs> i mean, just like sometimes just listen to that on repeat um oh. so yeah maybe that had like some influence in all the like fleshy squishiness of the bodies <laughs> i love it i love it i love it um what a trip um and to hear hear about music being a part of your process actually is uh it's always like I think about just creating and how sort of mediums kind of really do, you know, kind of push into each other the way like an artery does. You know, um, I was reading something about the kidney for whatever reason. I've, I've just been like, I can't 
get enough of like UFC. And for some reason I was just, um, they're talking about body shots and, um, and someone hits the body, but I think art very much is like that. You know, it's, it's mm. serves a purpose in humanity and culture. And when a force in that artery in general kind of pushes or pulsates the opposite end sort of reacts to that. And, um, yeah. So in the very same way, you know, your art inspires a lot of what I do. And it's actually really, really, really cool to, to hear that it works that opposite way too. It's really dope. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I always think about how like as artists, it's, I mean, kind of the amazing thing is that you have this skill set. Oh, this is like, if you hear anything, it's just my dog, like <laughs> scratching herself and being a mess. But, um, but yeah, the way that like, as artists, we just get to kind of have all this input of information and then we go do whatever our practice is, like whatever it is that we specifically have been practicing for like, you know, basically usually since we were like little kids, right? <laughs> and it's like this skill set, right. but it's combined with this sort of this history of having practiced a skill, but then you're always responding to sort of the immediacy of like everything from like what you see on your way to the studio, whether it's like the music studio or the <laughs> painting studio and right. like, Right. It's just like, it's amazing, I think, to be able to sort of have all of that going into you. And then you get to the studio and you're like, how am I going to have this go through this, like, actually kind of formal skill that I've been practicing forever? Yeah, absolutely. And and sort of the way that uh, the way that things evolve as they're being as as we're being influenced is is probably one of the most interesting things, especially about the past year. Mm -hmm. because I mean how could we not evolve in <laughs> some way, shape, form you know I mean you know as you're saying you know as you even if it's subconscious we pick up on on things wherever it's like advertisement or mm -hmm. uh, you know someone on the street or some you know or an emotion you hear in a song or a conversation you had and so on and so forth um I, I'm curious as to like how and, and what maybe, you know, has been pushing on you because there's things that like my, my whole perspective is like shifted in a lot of ways in the, in yeah. the past year. I mean, down yeah, to the, for sure. I, I'm curious, like if there's anything that just like gra has been grabbing you. Well, it's funny. I mean, I don't know. I, I've been kind of like, I mean, for, for many reasons, I kind of am like, I wish that this pandemic had like, ended like three months earlier. Cause I feel like three months ago, I was very much like, had like a full sort of cycle of how, like how I had developed. Cause it was this sort of like, at the beginning, I mean, I had all these shows that were gonna be happening and I had just come back from London and I was gonna be traveling to like a million places this year. And then all of a sudden, like I was working on my Chicago show and all of a sudden it was like, all flights canceled, all talks canceled. And I was like, well, actually, like, I'm so stressed out that this is kind of a relief that I get to, like, stay in one place, even though these things I've been working so hard on are now, like, maybe not even going to happen. But it was this moment of being like, I've been working so hard and so fast for so long that this is like, I know, I think in like our culture, it's like this idea that you have to just keep escalating, keep working harder and harder. And there's kind of not really a lot of explanation for how you then rest and sustain in that mode. It's kind of like, I don't know, I've been working on this, like kind of like, I got to hustle because this might be my last chance kind of. Um, and so, and I think we kind of equate slowing down with failure or with like not being successful. So this was like on a global scale, like, okay, I am slowing down. And it's not my fault. It has nothing to do with my career, my success or anything. But like, so that was like, that was my immediate sort of feeling of like, wow, I've been moving so quickly and I didn't even have a second to realize how messed up it was in a way. Um, and then like, there was stuff next. I'm curious, like, what was your sort of like initial, like March, 2020 vibes? Ooh, a year ago. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I was, I, I was already in like trying to, re I was in rev up mode. Mm. Um, and we'd been like prepping for, for getting, some of the ideas and the things we were creating out. And I was like, all right, let's go. It's, you know, yeah. it's time to push the, you know, ball up the hill and like try and build momentum. And then, uh, and I was in the studio heavy and I'll never forget. I think it was, it was uh, I was at East West Studios here in, in 
in Hollywood and we were all kind of like watching the news and, and updating each other, you know, from different rooms because uh, there's a common <laughs> area and we, you know, you go into the kitchen and, you know, everyone's like, hey, like, are you hearing about this thing? I'm like, yeah, we're, we're kind of seeing it on, 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 on social media and, and it's, it's weird. I don't think it'll last too long, but right. it's crazy. And, and it was like, yeah, you know, we got to close the studio. So all, all sessions canceled, you know? Yeah. And, and then just going home and being like, well, okay. <laughs> what, what would it last? Like a couple months, a month, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe like a month. Right. And after the first two months, it was like, nah, this is gonna, this is gonna go. So I kind of leaned into it and um, to your point in the same way, I was actually really, after, after getting comfortable with like just accepting it, um, mm -hmm. which I've been working on for a long time, I just flow with things, you know, sometimes you just can't, you can't force things. And right. if the whole <laughs> world, especially if the whole world is like, you know, if, if, if it's all yeah. slowing down, you just kind of got to just let it wash over. And I kind of just stopped. I stopped yeah. and just kind of was like, let me just be a sponge, accept how I feel, accept all of the devastation because there's a lot of, you know, just a lot of emotion that people were actually losing their lives. And yeah, they're trying to manage it by not like staying too glued to the TV and the news, which was, this right. is a challenge, you know, but after that, then it was just like, let's have fun. So there was like moments. Like, <laughs> yeah. I was like, slow down. All right, well, cool. We're just going to have fun. Just chill and wait this out a little bit. And then it was like, oh no, we can't go anywhere. Right. <laughs> because we live in LA, it was like, well, great. I have, I have weed and that's perfectly legal. So I'm going to enjoy right. that. Be outside. To, 72 yeah. degrees. <laughs> Watch as many movies and, you know, and, and that yeah. kind of thing. But yeah, it, it definitely was a interesting, interesting year. You know? Yeah. I mean, it felt like there were, there definitely was that sort of like, I don't know, peaks and valleys of the quarantine of like, and it felt too like every time I sort of was like, okay, I've got a handle on like what my daily routine is with staying indoors. It would just be like, the news would just be so crazy, so devastating. Um, and then of course, like the summer with just like, you know, suddenly it was like people being like, okay, all of the things that we, we know are, well, that many of us know have been true for a long time. And then, you know, the first like several months of the pandemic were very clear, like, okay, yeah, there's like, you know, there's issues dealing with class, with race, with equity that are going on in this country that haven't going on forever, but you throw a pandemic in on it and you throw like, you know, at home education in on it. And then you're still like having police brutality with it. And you're just like, oh. okay, like, oh. this is not, this is like, we can't do this anymore. And like, so it felt like there was a sort of like, I don't know, almost this kind of like everything was still bubbling under the surface up until like, Memorial Day. And mm -hmm. then it was just like, it was like, you kind of couldn't turn away after that point. So it felt like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I'm sure that this isn't like <laughs> new stuff for you. I know it wasn't new for me, but it was this, this suddenly like, again, it was that sort of global reckoning that I felt like was such a, such a thing, like so kind of emotionally taxing to like, kind of go through that with everybody suddenly being like, I've never thought about this before. <laughs> like, what do we do about racism? And it's like, well, okay. <laughs> it's a long road. Right. Yeah. And, and the conversations, I mean, that was actually probably my favorite part was because it, it did feel like, you know, like Riptide. I got, yeah. caught in, I got caught in Riptide once when I was younger. We were at the beach every day of the summer. I grew yeah. up in <laughs> classic Southern California. You know? And, um, and I got caught in a riptide, and I'll never forget the feeling of just no, it just relentless, mm -hmm. you know, just being hit relentlessly with yeah. no mercy. And it, as we were talking about, it, I was like, oh yeah, I mean, it was it was locked down before that. It was like, and be, again, I'm from Los Angeles, so anyone who's tuned in, I mean, Kobe is a, is like hero. Right. Yeah. I mean, so it was like Kobe passes, and then this thing, and then then George Floyd and all of the subsequent, just mm -hmm. everyone's, it almost just seemed like that same relentless, like, okay, we've got to really figure out how to swim parallel right now. Right. <laughs> yeah, I can't fight it. Yeah. 
because the shore is closed but if we don't if we don't figure out a different approach and trying to fight against it in the in the ways that you know seem like we could tuck it away you know because yeah. that's what all this is it's just like a it's just like everything coming back to the surface mm -hmm. and we just end up in the same place that was that was a lot that was a lot yeah for sure i mean i feel like i mean i kept continually just being so grateful that i had access to making art and to other artists and i mean i feel like that's sort of i don't know i feel i felt like having all of those conversations that needed to be happening and just having a familiarity with having conversations and figuring out how to sort of like i don't know how to sustain these these like ongoing problems. Like, again, I guess I keep thinking about this idea of like sustainability and maybe it's because we're coming out of, like, I don't know, we're hopefully coming out of the lockdown, but like at least vaccines are becoming more available in the United States. And, um, and just trying to think about how to like use all the lessons of the last year and to have that be like an actual change rather than just like back to normal, back to work. I guess that's like why like the last three months have been such a drag for me. Cause I'm like, Oh no, now everyone figured out like how we're supposed to work in this time. Like, <laughs> and I still can't go to parties really, but I'm like having to <laughs> work just as hard as I ever did. Um, and like, I don't know. I mean, I feel like that, that this last summer was really about seeing these, these problems that have been sustained for so long, but then it's like, how do we address them in a way that's also sort of this ongoing accountability, this ongoing change. And like, I don't know, like changing sort of the duration of how we respond to things too, I think is important because you know, before the pandemic, I felt like everything was just reactionary. And I think that's still sort of where we kind of like where our headspace goes to, but it's like, yeah, I've just been trying to think about like how to slow down that duration or get to like, tap into some of that snow, like that slowness that was going yeah. on last year. Yeah. I, 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 I couldn't, I, it, I think about it all the time in terms of even myself, like just to be completely honest, like, um, we're still dealing with lots and lots of the same, you right. know, I think just last week I saw, and it's, you know, it's like, and it's been th this way in terms of injustices and, and things happening. It's just that we've, obviously we have access to proving it right. and we can <laughs> it instantaneously, but it, it doesn't make the in-betweens, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily make it top of mind. And mm -hmm. In the same way, I've been thinking of like, why is that? How do I continue to, how do how do we keep it top of mind, but be balanced? And I think that's one one thing that I've almost, I almost feel like, and I hope for the best in this way, I, happen to, I, I lean towards my cynicism because hu human beings are creatures of habit. And right. this stuff has been a part of humanity since the history of. You know, um, <laughs> you know, just just you know, just discrimination towards people who don't look or have or behave or believe, right. you know, in the same ways. And um, I I do feel like we're going we're sort of in a transition period where we have the opportunity to, you know, maybe grow up a little bit. But I, mm -hmm. I you know, trying to also be balanced with the expectation. You know, it's it's a it's a trip. And then I always feel like. Is it my responsibility mm -hmm. to be an escape or mm -hmm. is it my responsibility to address right. or is it best to do both? So yeah. I'm a little torn, you know, and, and um, I'm sort of curious, like if you have any perspective or, or you know. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been, I mean, for me, like my whole journey has been like making art forever, but not really having anybody else look at my art until very recently. I mean, and like, I'm like 36. So the last five years is really when like people have seen my art <laughs> in any, like besides my mom and my like classmates. Um, and so it's really been kind of like adjusting to that new pace while also trying to like figure out kind of what that platform holds for me and like the responsibility of that and, and wanting to just also think through like how to sort of bring up the the communities and like the opportunities that I was given that allowed me to be where I am today because I think that I mean I think so much about whatever kind of art you make is ultimately about having 
the time to practice it. And it's like that time is such a luxury and it's something that, um, you know, it can happen with money, but it can also happen from encouragement from just having like, you know, the space to do that. So there's, there's a lot of ways that you can give people that time, but, um, but it's giving people access to that time. I think earlier on (laughs) rather than just trying to let more people like try to diversify, like who you, who like the gatekeepers let into like the next level. It's more like, how do we get more people being able to have that dream or more people being able to, how do we diversify the pool of people that are having that dream as kids, you know? (laughs) So that's been some, I mean, I've benefited from like this public arts high school in Los Angeles um, that I got to go to that allowed me to make my art as a kid for no money at all. Um, But yeah, I mean, but it is hard because at the end of the day, I'm like, well, what I, what I do, what I know I can do best is, is my paintings and, um, and my art. And it's like wanting to let my art also be able to sort of speak for itself and have an experience that maybe is not tied into like a didactic verbal language. Like that's the whole point of it, right? Is that it's not, um, it's not a statement. It is this sort of experience. Um, and it can be also like the solace for people that have to have those conversations every day and they want to just look at something or listen to something that's, um, a, like a way of feeling understood. I don't know. I feel like that's, maybe, um, I guess, I guess I, I see it as having like these parallel practices maybe. So it's like, I don't know, the same way that like my day would not be complete if I was just in the studio painting. I also need to see my friends and hang out with my wife and walk my dog. And I don't know, like listen to music or dance or whatever. Like, it's like all those things make me a better artist, make me a more well-rounded person. And so I feel like it doesn't have to all, ha- like all my activism doesn't have to happen in my art. Sometimes it can happen from like donating money or donating time or, um, you know, opening up the floor for somebody else to speak. So, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. How are you like, cause I mean, I think with music, one of the amazing things about it is that it's, um, it's just so much more accessible. I feel like, mm-hmm. I don't know, I, I've studied art for a long time and I still will go into a museum or a gallery and feel like intimidated or, like, like stupid. Cause I don't understand it. I'm like, I'm like, should I get this work? I don't get this work. And I'm like, I mean, I went to like Yale for grad school. Like I can't be more educated in my field, but I'm still like, I don't, I don't remember like the name of that person. Like, but music is like, I never feel stupid when I listen to music. I just feel like I either like it or I don't like, or I'm like challenged by it or it's like easy. I don't know. Like, how do you, like, how do you, I guess, sort of use that sort of welcoming and like folding in that music can have. Um, And like, I don't know, are there like lessons that us artists and like art institutions can use to try to make people feel less like intimidated by it? Man, that is, that is a great question. (laughs) Uh, See, yeah, access is a, is a trippy thing. It kind of also, it also, man, classism and, you know, I think it, I think it's, has its, its ways, its, its roots run deep in, and it's made its ways into so many and taken so many forms, right? I mm-hmm. think um, because music sort of, wow, let me really think about this. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess that like going back to like your original like conversation, cause I was just like <laughs> weaving off in all these directions, but like, I mean, cause some of, some of your music really does point to these like issues that I can relate to and stuff. Like, I mean, I just thinking like, you know, back to like listening to Wild Heart in grad school, like you had that song about like not fitting in or like being too much yeah. of one thing and like things like that, where it's like, yeah. oh yeah, I could tap into that. But then also there's other parts of your music where it's just like, I don't know, it's even just like being able to listen to like sounds and voice and harmony and having different genres coming in there that also is, I don't know, it feels powerful and political without having to actually like spell it out too. But like, how do you relate to that that conversation of like how <laughs> how much of your message do you put in the art and how much of it's like it's, next to the art? <laughs> it's been such a like process to figure it out um, because I'll be honest with you, just as like a, just as a human being, I guess my, um, my priorities are shifting. Yeah. So, you know, 
with that, there is a bit of like, okay, you know, if this is, if my work is a reflection of who I am Mm -hmm. um, and I'm an instrument, um, if what, what my soul is telling me is that I care about, you know, A, B, and C, for me not to to speak it, you know, there there's a little there's a lot of consideration, and I've I've tried it, I've tried it, and when it comes out naturally, I love it. Like I yeah. just I just wrote a song about purchasing my first firearm. Um, I was raised super religiously. I I was never like of guns. My mom wouldn't even let me play with toys that look like guns. Right. You know. Um, but because of the reality and, you know, we see it every day, my, my perspective has changed. That Mm -hmm. song came out. It wasn't, I wasn't trying to say anything about or comment on anything. Um, and I find that maybe I'm trying, I'm, it's less about, for me, it's been, it's been, it's felt more genuine when it's not trying to comment on it. Right. just letting it come out if it comes out and and when it when that happens just like that song that you're talking about um that wasn't like let's write a song about being (laughs) you know of mixed heritage which we both are we know the you know how you know how you know how people want you to choose a i mean when we were kids it was like are you black are you (laughs) are you mexican this is like annual test kind of thing you know it's like question yeah. and answer on the daily and like on paper um yeah so. being like multiracial in the 90s was a weird thing to be because <laughs> it was very much like i don't know i feel like everything was like about checking off a box and there was no option for that um yeah. but also kids i mean i think what i what i liked about that like kind of the the words of that song was that it was it was really located in childhood too, where I feel like, I mean, that's when I started questioning identity really was as a kid because kids are just so like, what are you? Like, that's like what kids say on the playground. They're like, where, what are you? Like, where's your mom from? Like, that's what they say. And then if they don't like, when I would be like, oh, my dad's black, my mom's white. And they'd be like, no, you're not like, you're lying. And like, the kids will say that, like <laughs> adults will say that, like yeah. in complete, like they'll say that, but not say that. But like kids will just say it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and like. And, but I feel like for me that really like opened me up to being like, well, okay, I'm not lying. But like my like classmate just told me I was lying. So like, or, there isn't a box that I can check off on this like standardized test. So like, what is my identity? Like, what is race? And like, it got me thinking about these questions that you know I still think about today. I still work through and ultimately I landed on painting because it's a visual medium. So it doesn't have to like rest in language as much. I mean, it's a visual language, but things can happen simultaneously that are contradictory. And I feel like, yeah, I mean, I, that's like what was interesting to me about that song was that you had it in childhood. Um, and then also like the idea too, that you were, you were talking about being like too much of something. Like it wasn't like you weren't enough. It's like, you're too much. And that's also something I think about too. It's like, it's not that I'm like not black enough. It's that I'm too white, <laughs> you know? Um, right. and like, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, like, I'm very curious just cause I always like hearing other people's like experience of being like biracial mixed race and stuff. Like what was, <laughs> what's, what's your connection to that? I think that, I think that's a, in general, anyone who doesn't is ambiguous, you know, in terms of, you know, it's like you can't really put your finger on it. Mm-hmm. We just, we just want to, understand things and when we don't understand things we're afraid of them there's bias, and that's where the whole bias thing and that's just like you know it's like deep you know just dumb baggage that right. we <laughs> pick up from previous and like weird you know the people that we grow up with and, and so on and so forth all that stuff is i think across the board if you talk to anyone who's who looks racially ambiguous they're going to tell you like yeah i i I mean, I have, we, I'm sure you have tons of friends. We, yeah. we have tons of friends that are like, yeah, shit was weird. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Hey guys, hammer. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it, I think it, uh, across the board, it's just, it's just, unfortunately that's how we think. 
you, yeah. I mean, you've been taught to think of, to identify things and to want to, to identify them. So then we can, I mean, in this system, in the way that the system works is really, I think ultimately, and this can go a whole other conversation, but right. again, it's just market system really always ends up being about identifying things so they can be categorized to better market them or to better sell them. Yeah. And until you can identify what something is, then you can't really pick it apart and say why someone should purchase it, you know, right. um, which is actually why I also, I think, really love your, your work is, is because you, judo, are you like, you kind of like really, <laughs> is that like jiu the whole thing? And it's you, it's so you and it's not trying to be anything i i think we we always celebrate artists who are able to really be themselves yeah. find there's something there that feels like i know this but you can't put your finger on it right right i mean i think that that's like i don't know i, I feel like there's oftentimes like the most pressure to sort of fit into these categories or like be legible like we put the most pressure on ourselves to do that just because it's like we want to be understood and we want to fit in and like I mean you know it's something that I struggle with with like a lot of aspects of my identity because it doesn't like you know I, I grew up without a lot of money but I grew up like next to a lot of money like in LA so like I had access to certain things but you know technically didn't have like a ton of money growing up or like my race or, or like even like being queer is like kind of these like it doesn't quite fit into any one category that neatly, but I find that it's like, you know, you want to, so you can be understood by people. And so I think that like, I don't know, one of the things I've tried to tap into with my paintings is really trying to get to, I guess that's kind of like what you're talking about before. It's like when it comes out naturally, when it doesn't feel like it's a sort of like forced statement, but it's actually like you're not, you're not like describing the thing. You're actually like, it is the thing. And so for me, like with my paintings, I really try to tap into that. Like, you know, like, what is it to be in a racialized body? What is it to be in like a gendered body, a queer body? And like, we're all in bodies that are like, you know, racialized or gendered. Um, and so for me, it's like much more about like the compositions of the body or like playing with like the edge and the frame and like what it is to sort of know the limits of legibility, but then to still like have agency and like activation and freedom within that. So it's like, but it's not like actually like literally like, I don't know, like this is one of my paintings behind me. It's like, mm -hmm. there's no like actual skin color. It's like raw canvas, which I guess you could say is like Caucasian, but it's not, it's just raw canvas. It's like an absence of paint. Um, but there's like pinks and yellows and like crazy colors, um, fuchsias and grays. So I feel like yeah, as like artists, it's like you can talk about something and really get to like kind of like the soul of it or like the meat of it without kind of getting to like the didactics of it. Yeah, I that's actually that's probably what really also draws me to your work is is that it's more the emotion, and I think it is also the movement. You know, I feel so much movement in each one. It's you know, obviously it's this, 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 this frame. But this, but the movement is what really grabs. So it, it, you never really need to know what the per or what the the forms are. You mm -hmm. feel what they are. So you don't really question. And that's the thing about humanity. Like human be human humanity is the race, right? <laughs> it's human race, right? So when you feel something, that's what that's the thing about. I think a big difference back to your question between sort of the accessibility of music hmm. um, is that it's music as a communicator um, hmm. was never about this part. Right. Yeah. Down, let me try to understand. It was never like a textbook thing. It was like, if you feel it, right. <laughs> people feel it. And it grabs people. I mean, obviously over time, you know, it's become a business and so on and so forth. Right, sure. But great music stands the test of time. And that's the emotion. That's the the soul part. And I think that's maybe the difference in accessibility is that there are really heady 
you know, I mean, to your point, I definitely walk into the hammer <laughs> and I'm like, I don't get this blank canvas or just all black or, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I'm trying to understand the statement, um, not to point out any artists or their work, all, all respect, but, but, you know, I think there's, um, you know, there's a, there's a certain intellectual approach that is valuable, um, especially in terms of preservation you know, and, and, and especially with technique and execution and, yeah. you know, qualities that are, are valuable. But um, I do think that sort of the, 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 the things that are celebrated and most timeless in music, I think, are always end up being like, really, they hit you right, right here. Right. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's like, I mean, because ultimately it is this thing that then you can also interact with, with this expression of like movement and dance and like, I don't know, it just, it, it can, it can reach you on a more physical level where I feel like with art, I mean, some of the, the work that I was able to get into when I was younger was always like installation based or sculptural or, or things where I could really feel my body in the work. Um, and actually like painting is kind of like the last type of art that I like, even though it's what I make. Um, cause I like making paintings cause I can be physical making it. Um, but, and I, I try to have some of that awareness of your own body when you, when you look at one of my paintings. Um, but I think that that's, it's just, Definitely. yeah, it's helpful to kind of just get out of your own head. I feel like to think, to actually, to actually be able to think it's like, you kind of need to take sort of like all of the, your learning and language kind of out of the equation. And then you can actually kind of have that conversation about what it's about, you know, and it's music, it's, it's just a, it's just a medium that gets you there really quickly. Yeah. And that, that's, a, that's the whole thing is like the greatest, I think, understood how important it was to make the technique of things, the ability, second nature. Right. And that's where like, you know, just our first conversation, just over the phone, one of the things that you said was, was like, I, I just need to do my work. Right. You know, I think a real artist really has an affinity for that because we understand the value of repetition, <laughs> learning, <laughs> technique, yeah. how that is a translating so that you don't have to think when you're doing your work. Right. Yeah. So you're, you're able to flow and it comes through you you know and that's like the, the real work of an artist is like yo just how can I get what is here or right here how do I how do I somehow transmute that into something that can other people can see or feel or yeah or, that's I I, I I think it's so clear in your works like I just like it, it's, it's <laughs> I'm like that's why I'm like I don't own one yet <laughs> when I can own one I'm gonna own one <laughs> um, well, talk <laughs> um yeah I mean I think that that's it like that's what makes art I mean it's something that I keep thinking about when I think about like kind of what's the what's the political power of art and I feel like it's ultimately that it's so process-based and it's so in like the process of making and then the process of experiencing it whether it's you know listening to it or moving through it or looking at it but it's it's ultimately this unfolding that can happen in a way that's not it's not completely linear. It's not completely like, you know, it's not just saying a statement because as soon as you say a statement or attach words to it uh, that are literally trying to describe it, it's like, I don't know. So when you try to like describe a dream after you wake up, it's like, oh. it, it's like, it makes you forget it. <laughs> by trying oh. to talk about it. You're like, it's not quite it. And yeah. it's like, I feel like that's, that's the power of art is not thinking of it as this like static object or like, you know, the static thing, but that it actually is something that, has a different duration and I feel like that's something maybe that I was trying to like pick up on earlier with this idea of like what are we going to be once we like get out of lockdown and I think it's like I don't know just changing our duration to things having it not be so much like or even like you know the response to George Floyd over the summer and and, and people being like you know people trying to be like how do I come out as anti-racist and it's like well you can <laughs> say that but then it's like a process it's like a lifelong process it's like working over and over again. And it's like, I think that art kind of helps tap people into that process mm. that's sort of not fully in like an articulatable <laughs> kind of language, but it's more through this like, yeah, cause you're doing something technical, but this sort of like subconscious is flowing through your technical skill. Um, 
I think that's also why in on the opposite end, why art and visual art is still a haven. Like I, I love art for the fact that it's protected in that way, that mm -hmm. technique, true technique, true, you know, uh, not just the talent, but like the, all the things that go into really making art. It's not like something you can just go like buy. There's no plug in for that. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's like, and for those of you know, it's like, you know, you can't just, it's just so, like music is almost lost its value because it's so easily created, created, mm -hmm. um, so easy to manufacture. Um, I mean, you don't even have to buy music anymore. <laughs> yeah. So in, in the, on the opposite end of what I was saying before, I think there's, there's always that, that interesting balance where, you know, I love, I love the accessibility. I don't like so much the accessibility. Right. <laughs> so it's like finding that balance. And then to, to your point, like what you're saying in terms of making sure things become more consistent and not just like moments and blips, yeah. you know, learning about, you know, human life and justice and fairness and equality. But that's mm -hmm. not just like a, you know, a quick moment. That is just something that becomes the standard. I hope, right. I hope it's something we find more equilibrium at the time. I hope, you know. I think your work, I think, I think when I look at your work, I, I think it's that kind of work that helps bring people together in that way. Mm. You know? And I, that's what I'm, I hope music I, I love music that does that i strive to create music that brings people together you know yeah. then, then we start to realize the humanity i am not female i'm not queer i'm not you know what i mean but mm -hmm. i identify with the soul in your music I, excuse me in your work. <laughs> <laughs> see it, it's, there's no difference it's yeah, just art it's soul you know it's just different expressions of it yeah uh, yeah, I mean, one of the yeah. things that I find is really interesting and that like, you know, I'll talk to students about sometimes, but like this idea that, I don't know, you'd think that in order to appeal to a broader audience, you'd have to be like really general. But I found that it's actually like whenever you're super specific, like you're highly specific about your own experience, your own interests, and you actually like think about it beyond sort of like the, like the cliches or like the I don't know, we had this, I was in this um, artist residency in Maine uh, in 2016 called Skowhegan. And they, this one artist had this project where he had us all send in like, cause like artists always have artist statements. And so we all sent in like 200 words of our artist statement and then he'd read them all in a row and they all sounded the exact same. It was like the same words over and over again. And like, from that point on, I was like, okay it's really important to be way more specific with my experience. Um, and I, it's like, once I tapped into that specificity, it seems like that's actually kind of strangely, like when it could be tapped into more universally. It's like somehow that's when people are like, oh wait, I feel that, like I get that experience. And like, I think that's kind of the, it's, it's, it's not what you would think. You'd think that by being super specific, you'd alienate everybody, but it's actually like, I found that those moments of like high specificity, people are like, oh yeah, me too. That's how I feel. <laughs> And one of the one of my favorite, and you just said it that um, oh, because you realize that we're not so different, right? Like oh, whatever we think is different. Not the human. Like we feel the same. You know, we feel the same things. We go through yeah. these things, right? Um, one of my favorite things. I don't know if I said this, but one of my mentors, Mark Pitts, he said, uh, he said, a gr great songs are. Uh, great songwriting, but I think this applies across the board to your point, is other people seeing themselves in your details. Mm. So I guess in the same way, like you said, the more specific, the more detailed and clear about your POV or perspective, right? right. You are, I think people start to feel like, oh yeah, I, I, I feel that too. I see that <laughs> too. Maybe a little different way, but a version of it that's, you know, we're not so different. That's, yeah. I guess that's, that's the whole purpose of art, I guess, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's definitely, like, what can be really powerful about it and, like, why I guess I get bummed out sometimes that visual arts can feel, like, a little standoffish or inaccessible to certain people because I feel like the power of it is that it actually is something that can position a lot of different people 
in in a conversation that they maybe like wouldn't have or like wouldn't have maybe like the tools to have but it like yeah it just it creates this sort of common ground to start talking about things and start processing other feelings that maybe or like thoughts or ideas that would be difficult to imagine or even like your conversation to have otherwise mm -hmm. um and I feel like yeah I mean it's something that I see in art I just <laughs> it can be hard because you sometimes get caught up in like being like well I don't I don't get it should I get this like <laughs> or like I could make this like my kid could make this like that kind of thing but that's like when you think of it as like an object but it's like if you actually like sit in front of it and like experience it and try to experience it more the way like you experience music or um or dance or like any other form of more physical art you can actually like I think start to tap into that conversation because you aren't worried about being wrong it's like there's no there's nothing wrong about it it's just like I don't know do you feel it or do you not right 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 I'm, cu I'm curious um should we jump into questions should yeah why not <laughs> man I, the um I don't know how to do that but um I think I think someone's gonna oh. pop in. <laughs> we'll right. see. <laughs> yeah, Hi. I'm gonna pop in. Uh -huh. Thank you guys so much. This has been so much fun. Um, I'm such a huge fan of both of your work, but now I feel like we're BFFs and we're just hanging out on the couch. <laughs> like we should have a pizza, and you know, you guys don't know who the heck I am, but I feel <laughs> like we're all friends now. So thank yeah. you. It's really fun. It's one of the things I love about Zoom. It's so intimate. Right <laughs> now, you get to see all your yeah like, puppy in the background, and <laughs> so we have um we do have a lot of audience questions, and I'm gonna um, read some of them to you, and you can respond. Some of them are more personal, some of them are sort of global. Uh, I'll start out with a sort of fun personal one. Um, Bianca Zelaya asks if you revisited or picked up any new hobbies during the pandemic. She started roller skating, and I want to make it just a quick side note. That World on Wheels in LA, which is the amazing um, roller rink that I go to, so that Nip Nipsey Hustle revitalized. They just closed because oh. of losing business during COVID. And um, so, if there's any billionaire roller skaters out there in the audience, please come save World on Wheels. Yeah. Skateland in Northridge. But anyway, did you guys do anything fun like that during COVID? <laughs> I think about it. Ooh, new hobbies. Uh, man, I wouldn't say new. I probably ran through like so many video games, way more. Than <laughs> I, could. I try my best to stay away from them because when I start, it's like there's no stopping. That's it. It's like I'm locked into a video game. So I ran through like the entire Resident Evil franchise uh, <laughs> <laughs> through COVID in about a month. I don't know. It's bad. <laughs> I feel like I did like the opposite end of that spectrum, which is that like, I, I didn't, I didn't learn how to read in COVID, but I definitely like was not a reader my whole life. And then I feel like what I did is I got a, I got a waterproof Kindle so I could like read it in the bath. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I was, I, it suddenly like, and then also I got a library card where you can like get free eBooks sent over to the Kindle. So I was set, but also I kind of realized that like, I always thought that to read meant that you had to read something like really complicated or hard, but then I was like, oh, you can just read trash. And so like, I just read like trashy novels <laughs> and I was like, and I look smart cause I'm reading, but I'm actually like <laughs> basically watching stupid TV. The Kindle, water waterproof Kindle with the library card is a life hack. Yeah, it That's really is. <laughs> it's like a little bit of, a little bit of investment up front for the Kindle, but really makes up for it with all the free library books <laughs> and magazines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to give a shout out to the public libraries. They saved my life during COVID and they're about to reopen for in-person visits as well. Ooh, exciting. <laughs> Going to a library is nothing like that to this day. Yeah. No, for sure. In, <laughs> literally grew up in the Inglewood library for real. <laughs> Librarians are everything. They're also tend to be very progressive and radical. I love them. Yeah. yeah. I like, I did not grow up in Beverly Hills. I grew up like mid city, but my mom would always like drive us to the Beverly Hills library. She was like, I got us library card for the Beverly Hills library. <laughs> that was like our like fancy afternoons. <laughs> That's sick. That. <laughs> She'd be like, That's it's fine. Sick. We got cards. 
Did I oh, actually don't, did anyone have a library card anywhere? Oh, I'll Google it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I actually don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I've been wanting to go to the um the library downtown. I haven't been in so long. Oh yeah, that's a nice one. It's like that's all cool. underground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's like secret corridors in certain places. You feel like if I pull a book from somewhere, maybe a door open. I don't know. It's kind of yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was like me as a little kid. I was always like, I'm gonna find the like hidden book of spells that like <laughs> witch left in this library. Like I never found it. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> that right. building is so beautiful too. Um, but that's a good lead into the next question, which is from Holly Nicholas, because um, you mentioned your mom taking you to the library. And Holly Nicholas asks, how important was having your family support in your decisions to become artists? Well, um, do you want to go first or should I? <laughs> I feel like I took the, the I, either way, but I took the last one first. So I was like, I'll give all right, I'll take, I'll take this one first. Um, I would say it was very important for me. I mean, my family was very supportive of me making art and yeah, like my cousin would give me like drawing lessons for birthday gifts. He'd be like, I'll teach you how to draw faces for your birthday. And like, that's how I learned how to draw faces. And, um, and yeah, so it was, it was definitely something I grew up around and like, I don't know. I, I definitely like, I hear stories from people that are like, oh, I never like met a living artist or like, it never occurred to me that I could be an artist. And so I definitely, I think that like a big part of you know, achieving things or, or having access to things is having just that ability to have that dream <laughs> even. And like, even though no one in my family was an artist for a living and I definitely like, I mean, I kept on my side job as a graphic designer all through grad school and post-grad school. Cause I was like, I don't know if I'll ever make money doing this, but, um, but yeah, I was definitely like, I might not make money doing it, but I can still always do it. So that was really important to me. Um, but yeah, what about you? Um, in the same way that that book, um, The Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, he talks about sort of the, the luck in having either being in a place where whatever it is the person grew, grew up to be, they just had a head start. So, you know, like a Bill right. Gates, you know, grew up in Silicon Valley and they happen to have one of the only uh computers in california let alone like the entire west coast at this college that he could go to community college like if that's not a head start yeah i mean i don't know what is right so and and we've seen sort of where he's gone with it i guess in this in the same way i got lucky because i had family that was like no you really can sing and you really can dance and like you're a you could be that you could do that like and encouraging mm -hmm. um I think it's it's sort of I always I always say that I w we were not rich at all. I grew up in the projects, uh, and when I was staying at my grandmother's house in Inglewood, she lived. We were at the library all the time because it was like a couple blocks away, and that <laughs> area is not really, you know, wasn't a lot of money there. Uh, we certainly were 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 not, uh, you know, I wouldn't say middle class family, but you know, everyone may may do. But what we did have was a support system. And so I would say in the same way, you know, just those little those little things, it's a trip how when you're a kid, that little push or belief or the lesson or yeah. you know, really makes, it changes the altitude by which you can, you know, mm -hmm. what possible, the possibilities of, of your dreams. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really feel like that, like, that's the thing. It's like equity really needs to start, like, with kids because it's like I mean that's like me too like I had a leg up because I was I was taking art classes at Barnsdale Junior Art Park um in Hollywood as a kid and that's like when I got put into like this figure drawing like it's adult figure drawing class when I was 12 so now I've like you know I'm 36 but I've been drawing with live nude models for like the last 24 years like that's a that's a lot of time some people are starting now um and it's like I don't know I feel like there's this it's this thing that keeps you know, keeps like white supremacy, keeps the patriarchy alive is like this idea that there's like geniuses that are born. And it's like, I'm not like a genius. I just am somebody that had access to art lessons as a kid and kept doing it because I liked it. 
And so I, I developed that skill. So now I can do it without thinking about it. Um, and it's like by doing it and not thinking about all the technical stuff, cause that's just second nature for me that allows like the creative ideas to flow through like we were talking about, but that's not like, I mean, that was just having happening to be in art classes. Cause my mom needed childcare and being okay. like art classes, science classes. Sometimes you're just after school playing with like the handball, like whatever we got to do to keep you like watched by some adult. Oh, right. Safe. <laughs> Safe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like when you give people that, that encouragement or even just like that time to practice or learn skills, like younger, it's like, then when they're in their twenties, it's like, they know it. Yeah. They, <laughs> they put it. in those like 10,000 hours they talk about. Right. Exactly. <laughs> more, more, yeah. more yeah. I was talking this week to Mr. Wash, who's this amazing artist who's in our current made in LA biennial at the hammer museum. And he said, basically what you just said that, that children need three things in his opinion to to grow mentally and one was just a space where they can hear themselves think like a quiet space to go after school where it's not filled with people and noise and television or whatever access to some kind of a library and then parental support and uh makes all the difference yeah. anyway uh, if, if i may move on to a new question which i think is a great question um Rachel Gibbons asks for both of you, are there any other artistic mediums that you each want to explore? Photography for me. Photography and film, filmmaking for sure. Hands down. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I, I would actually really like to learn some sort of musical instrument. I mean, I'm not at all musically minded. <laughs> what would you play? But I don't know. I mean, I feel like my wife has a guitar, so maybe a guitar because it's just at my house. <laughs> I, mean, um, I just feel like it would turn into like some other part of my brain it's just it's like art was always how I re would relax and now it's like my job I still relax doing it but it's like now I need like an extra an extra hobby to hang out with it's true and they say it's like new languages like they say that when you learn a new language and obviously we're talking about like spoken language that when you really learn it you dream differently so word, word association and, and, you know, whatever visual. Oh, cool. um, but I would assume that in the same way that when you learn a new, you know, instrument or creative, it, you dream differently in, in your other, what's it called? It makes total sense. It makes total sense. Yeah. I know when I started, started doing, started photography. I, it changed my songwriting because I pay attention to details differently. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. Do you, do you ever like incorporate like I, the, I guess you probably did. I was, I was looking at the, I don't have your like new vinyl <laughs> record, but it seems like I got a nice, a nice photo. <laughs> nice I didn't take it. Classic photo, no. but I didn't do that one. Because <laughs> you're no, in no. it. <laughs> that was Wyatt. No, Wyatt is brilliant. He's incredible. Wyatt, Wyatt Troll. He's, he's brilliant. His eye is amazing. And um, also very just like, I find it, I find photography and great photographers are just such like, they're just quiet and because they're just paying the best attention, they're, they pay the best attention, you know? And um, know the details. <laughs> and they're catching those little moments and also the timing. Hmm. I think the thing, there's a, to catch something in its time, you're almost imagining what it will be before it happens. So you right. catch it. You know? That's yeah, like yeah. You have to anticipate it. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. You must know a lot of photographers, I would assume. Just because yeah. I imagine that, like, your career has, like, a lot of interplay with people that are, okay. you know, me making music videos or photographing you for albums or magazine spreads. Like, yeah, you probably get to hang out with a lot of people that could be, like... A lot of good ones, yeah. They're actually... <laughs> I mean, in the same way, though, I would imagine that you actually know a lot of photographers as well, because oh yeah, a lot of painters. I don't. You're not painting from photography. This is like here. Yeah, it's all it's all in my brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no. I I mean, I know a lot of. I went to grad school with a lot of photographers, and yeah, it's definitely like a. That's the. I have such a hard time. 
I, that's like the type of art where I'm always like, oh, I feel like I don't understand this. <laughs> but then I see a photograph where I'm like, oh, I get it. <laughs> okay, you're like, they nailed it. So, <laughs> so this is what's gonna happen. Christina's gonna learn guitar and I'm gonna photograph her and she, it'll be her. <laughs> that's how we'll make it. Up. My new album. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh no, I need to stick to painting. <laughs> I would definitely buy that album in a heartbeat. Um, so that kind of brings up the question of obstacles. So I think this is kind of a good question for you guys. Alicia asks, did you have any creative blocks due to COVID? And I personally, I'm going to add on to that question. Can you talk about how as artists, having an obstacle might actually help you be more creative? Mm -hmm. Well... Let's see, obstacles. I mean, I feel like for me, it was just, I, I was surprised at how hard it was for me to get into the studio and paint because all like at the time my studio was just this little two car garage behind my house. Um, and I, I, I mean, I have a, a studio manager but I don't have anyone that like makes my paintings for me or like some big crazy production thing that I need. So I actually was like really well set up to make work in COVID because I'm always just by myself in the studio, but, um, but it was really hard to make work because it was so like mentally distracting and like, um, yeah, there was just so much pain and chaos and uh, so much going on that I found it really difficult to work at first. And then once I kind of was able to like, I guess, I guess for me, it was really about making work just for the pure joy of making it and thinking through making rather than being like, I don't know, I think one of the big problems at the beginning of COVID was people being like, I need to be productive, <laughs> you know, like constantly thinking about how to produce. And for me, it was like, I don't know, looking kind of at the limitations of my, of my sort of surroundings, working in a smaller space, which I find actually as an artist is like, I don't know, I feel like you also are always kind of marking success by going like bigger studio, bigger canvases and like, I actually learn a lot from sometimes scaling down. So I had moved into a tinier studio on purpose to like, just be able to be closer to my work, just make one painting at a time and like slow down that process. So I don't know, I found that that sort of like physical closeness to my work was really an interesting thing. And then to just have like nobody coming in and out of my studio other than like my like little six person pod, <laughs> I basically like bunked in with and started living with. Um, but yeah, I think that was the biggest obstacle really though, was just kind of reconciling this, like, I don't know, this sort of physical serenity and this mental like projected digital chaos and trying to like make sense of those two things happening at the same time. Yeah. In that same way, like, yeah, that, the, the feeling like there's something needs to be said, something needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, probably because of just the like, that's how we've been sort of interfacing with reality. For, you know, I have at least, you know, it's like, you have to produce, you have to continue. And I'd actually sat out, I haven't put out an album for like three years. So it was absolutely time, you know? Um, and this is like before COVID hit. So right. it was like, have to get stuff done but and then it became um that that quote uh oh my goodness please i cannot believe i'm not remembering <laughs> i need to eat a little so <laughs> yeah i know it's like dinner time yeah you know <laughs> it's like covid dinner time I'm like, For real, it's definitely covid dinner time <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh but you know like the job of an artist is, is to is to speak to the time that they live in um mm -hmm. and i definitely felt because i have the ability um i know that i could i know that i can mm -hmm. and not seeing you know also being like our our age we're, we're in the same age I'm, I'm 35 i'll be 36 this year so feeling a little bit of the responsibility because one I've been able to experience some success and that means I have a platform, you know, mm -hmm. there's a, 
that was a that was a little bit of a challenge because I again you're just kind of like okay how do I say what I'm feeling when I'm not even clear it's still a little bit of a chaos that was a that was a little bit of a challenge that was a hurdle um I think how it comes when it comes um will be really genuine because I at least kind of was just like all right let me just sit my ass down (laughs) if I'm not if it's not coming I can't force it you know and and that uh that actually I think really helps so start starting to find a better rhythm on how to again it's really just like hey what comes naturally as opposed to (laughs) I gotta talk about this thing and this happened and you know yeah this it's like man nobody wants to hear that either you know? <laughs> yeah no it's definitely like a learning curve for me like to try to tap into like being like oh I have to go into the studio and paint being like no I don't have to actually <laughs> and then having it's kind of easing into that that feeling I had you know back when nobody was looking at my paintings where it's like oh I want to go into the studio but that took a little bit of time for sure and then like I don't know I feel like we are at kind of a, an interesting I don't know, not to brag, but I feel like this is sort of like, if there is a good age for the last year, I feel like being in your mid thirties is kind of one of them because you're like, I had actually like, yeah, I'd like stopped drinking like at the beginning of March, just for like, I was like, I should just take a month off of drinking. And it was like my birthday. And I just like, was like, I'm going to have leftovers and hang out with my wife at home and watch TV. And then like, that's what the next like <laughs> 15 months was. But I was already mentally there. I was already like, yeah, I'm like I don't need to go out to everything. Um, I, was I was like, I'm I'm married, so in the same way, it was like, yeah, I'm actually okay. Like this is cool. I wrote a song. I literally wrote a song. Like, let the first line is let the world crash and burn. I'm down with it. You know, yeah. and I, and and, the, and it's all to say like, you know, sometimes this is also a line in the song. Sometimes you have to fall back just to move forward. Um, I do think that that's the simplest way of like my perspective on what we're dealing with but i will say like the fact that we i am we're in the same age range like experiencing life with at least we have partners you know what i mean it's like we're not already like kind of like settled a few things i feel like that's the thing with COVID. it's like if something was not working it really shined a light on it and like i mean our country was one of those things and like but then people's personal lives it's like whatever isn't really working like or like if you're like oh my my apartment really sucks but like it's fine because I go out to eat every night and then COVID happens and you're like gotta work on that apartment (laughs) gotta learn how to cook um and so I think like yeah hopefully I mean it's like it kind of reprioritizes all the noise and being like actually like my immediate situation if I strip it all away like what do I have and what do I need (laughs) Mm -hmm. so I mean I think that I mean in many ways I also had like a lot of sort of like I don't know like survivor's guilt. Cause it was like my first time where I was like, I just bought a house and I was like in Altadena where I feel like I'm like in the suburbs and I'm like, this is not how I've experienced any other crisis in my life. Like with like birds chirping and stuff. And like, I don't know. So I think that also kind of was like, put the fire under me to be like, how do I, what are my next steps? Like what's important to me? Um, Cause it can't just be like, just being comfortable. No, no, no. And and I think also it's like big shout out to everyone who's single watching. Um I know we're like, oh, our watch is so great. I know. Nice. I know, we kind of did rude. It. <laughs> I know. I, I I felt bad. I was like, oh, I'm not trying to rub it in. Um, uh, but but I will say that in the in in gratitude, I think it's like super so much in just in like gratitude and just like for for what is um being able to at least go, okay, well, things aren't exactly how we'd like them to be, but you know, mm-hmm. there's people who lived through World War One, right. two, two, <laughs> Vietnam, yeah. you know, like actual like war, like, like people and and kids who like just turning 18 that couldn't, you know, didn't get their graduation. I mean, there are times when people were just turning 18 and they were being shipped off to war, you know. Right. So it's a it's a trip, how we interface with with reality that I think in terms of hurdles that actually kind of was really helpful is to like really just lean into like just the gratitude, the things yeah. that are right. Cause it's a plenty and there will always be plenty <laughs> of things that are wrong. Right. I mean, that would definitely be like, if I would start to feel like 
too much like stress and anxiety and like depression around the whole everything, I would just be like, wait, have I, have I been on my phone for the last six hours? And I'd like turn it off and then like look out. I, I found myself like looking at the sky a lot in quarantine, just being like, and like in a lot of my paintings during the last year, like there's a lot of gradients in there. Cause I was thinking about sort of like the gradient of the sky, but then also the gradient of my computer screen, like this very digital space. Um, and I found that like, yeah, it was just always helpful to be like, okay, what actually is happening like right here? Mm-hmm. And like, there's all these things happening and they're all, they're all real, but like also what's the reality when I like don't look at the news. Yeah, it's real. Um, and trying to like use that to like regenerate because also all those things are there. And like, I mean, then I think it is like, when you have sort of things to be grateful for and you have support systems in place, it's like, then you do have like that extra energy. And then it's really important to use that extra energy for people that are like going through COVID. Like I, I think about like all the single parents in COVID and like all the parents period. And then single parents, I'm like, I don't know how. And <laughs> it's like that person's, that person can't be thinking about the things that like, I can think about and like maybe need to like put attention on and like do some hard work because I'm not trying to like do distance learning with a kid right now. And it's a trip, it's a trip, it's a trip. I, everybody had those crazy, like just, just, it was a trippy year, it was a trippy yeah. year. <laughs> and we're here. Yeah, walk away from it and not have learned something. I mean, I think that like, I mean, I, I think it's important to try to see sort of like the, at least have gratitude for like, what we've learned and even like if you haven't learned anything because you were too busy trying to raise kids or like hold down a job or like you know kind of keep transitioning how your job's going to take shape with different mandates and regulations and stuff it's like you know even still it's like knowing that like there was this sort of like global learning that's happening right now that hopefully we can do something with yes (laughs) i feel like i feel like we're in that place i feel like i feel like at least there was enough time to see things for what they really are. Right. Um, that that I've hit rock bottom before, like rock rock bottom, and it was not a. It was it was almost like you know the denial of it is worse than the rock bottom. Right. In the denial, I was causing more chaos, not only to myself, but like to the people that I love. You know, like people I actually love, and I feel like. We're sort of in this place where it's not right, but we're at least being able to go, yeah, this is not right. We can't pretend, you know, we're not going to pretend. And I think we're just going to see more and more of things right in our face until things start to really change. And it, it, that's probably what it's going to require, you know, it's like because the, hab- the habit, like cultural habit, you know, it's like, how do you <laughs> shift the whole human culture it just it's going to take lots of reminders unfortunately you know and and it's just the growing pains of it so you know yeah yeah (laughs) i think we kind of veered off but hopefully yeah (laughs) but yeah yeah, so the the obstacle was all of society (laughs) it's like earth (laughs) sucks earth is the obstacle yeah (laughs) we are the obstacle (laughs) this existed no Uh, (laughs) Well, speaking of gratitude, I think we're running out of time, but I am so grateful to both of you, Christina and Miguel. I want to thank you for all of the amazing work that you do. Everything that you said tonight resonates so profoundly, and I really can't thank you enough for sharing your work with us. And I want to congratulate Miguel on the new EP, Art Dealer Chic, (laughs) which was literally just released on April 9th, and you can find it on streaming services everywhere. And thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. us. I'm excited to see the Made in LA show soon. Now that yeah. games are open again. <laughs> Everyone come to the hammer and check out our amazing biennial, which is now open until July 25th. Made in LA. Yay. <laughs> I'll see you guys on the couch with our pizza later tonight. Yeah, to right? <laughs> Where's my pizza? <laughs> All right, cool. Bye.